Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Yulita. Um, I'm going to be hosting your event today. Um, just a little bit about me. I am the social marketing executive at Ridley Scott Creative Group, and I'm going to be joined today by Josh um, and Ella and Holly Wolfers. Um, and I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to kind of just talk a little bit about themselves. Um, but firstly, I thought I would just talk a bit about what Black Dog Films is and what this session is going to be. Um, so Black Dog Films is a creative and production company kind of specializing on really innovative youth culture focused um, film. So we do music videos, visuals, features, documentaries, branded content, a whole bunch of things. But the main ethos is that what we do is cool, kind of on the pulse kind of stuff. Um, and this session, we're just kind of be having a look at what a successful pitch is um, for music video and commercial, um, how to bring those ideas together, what kinds of things you need, budgeting, presentation, and just kind of how to get your idea made. Um, so I'm just gonna let everybody kind of speak a little bit about themselves, their experiences, and I'll start with you, Josh. Yes, thanks so much, Yelita, and happy to be here. I'm Josh Acapo, Head of Strategy at Archetype, and for those of you don't, who don't know, Archetype is a creative house made up of young creators and thinkers who move different. So what we do is nuanced thinking in research, insights, and strategy, co-creating with communities and transformative campaigns for brands from NHS to Lovebox Festival and everywhere in between. And then uh, move on to Holly. Hi guys, nice to meet you. I am a producer of Black Dog Films and RSA Films, which is part of the Ridley Scott's creative group. Um, I produce music video, um, branded content through to commercials, documentary, short films. Um, for the purpose of this chat, I'm just probably gonna focus on commercial and branding content and probably music video um, because otherwise we're gonna delve into a way bigger world, but lovely to meet you. And to Ella. Hi everyone. I am my name's Ella and I am co-founder and art director of Matinee Studio, which is a multidisciplinary design studio. Um, but I also specialize a lot in pitching with um, directors and production companies on various kind of series bibles, music videos, um, long form development, TV and film projects. Great, thank you for those intros, guys. Um, so yeah, that was just kind of to give a brief overview of what everybody does and kind of different ways they're each gonna be able to give a little bit of expertise on pitching as a whole. Um, this might sound a bit silly, but I think that maybe we should probably start with like what a pitch is, since you all kind of um, are part of different aspects of pitching and do pitching slightly differently. Um, and I think it'd be quite useful to the audience to kind of know how you do it for yourself. Um, so yeah, let's go back to you, Josh. Um, what is pitching? Oh, pitching. So many different things that can, I mean, a lot of people think pitching is like the elevator pitch and stuff like that in the world of business or the whole big presentation in the big office thing. It's really just how you're conveying your idea to whichever stakeholder is going to put resource behind it and invest in it. So um, a pitch in terms of the commercial and like music video world, that looks a lot like um a deck, a treatment that's storyboarded, that has sort of casting notes, that has um, ideas of what the actual, of what your actual creative is going to be, that um, sort of goes through and um, yeah, is developed with the back of, on the back of research, on the back of insights, on the back of strategy, and on the back of a really solid creative idea that's going to push through into some really nice um, produced material, whether that's going to be a film, whether that's going to be a commercial, whether that's going to be a music video, or in my case a lot of sort of educational films and campaigns and things like that um that's what a pitch aims to do um yeah although i must say pitches can be very very diverse but here we're primarily going to talk about ads and the music video world um yeah well holly and um ella could you guys kind of touch a bit more on that as well so like what commercial pitches are because i guess that's you guys as more area as well sure i mean i work with ella a lot on um most of our pitches, actually, she's the best treatment designer and researcher out there. Um, but basically, what I guess what it is for me is that I probably oversee sort of the whole process from, um, it could be from getting in the job, um, putting a director up to then liaising with the client or the agency or the, the label, um, to then helping the director shape their creative and kind of guide them 
and then you know making sure that the schedule and the budget and approach works because obviously we're it's all about money as well at the end of the day so we've got to make sure you know this this idea this creative is the same as like you know we can make it achievable um so that's sort of what i do on like i see yeah the process from start to finish um and then ella fits in into that so maybe you can jump in ella yeah, I feel like both, both of you kind of covered what I was going to talk about. But um, yeah, essentially, I a pitch is sort of creatively communicating an idea or a set of ideas to the client. Like when I'm pitching through the studio, I'm sort of articulating in a more human way, um, like why I'm the right, I'm the right person, the right, why we're the right team to take on the project. So I guess that's like when I'm working with Holly and we're working with directors um we're sort of selling in the directors through the visuals through the written aspect of the treatment like a an outline of how um the the film or the commercial or the music video um hopefully will will look so yeah it's trying to get someone on board with your creative concepts and just demonstrating how you're gonna um do that in a in a document in a creative document i guess yeah that's great guys. Um, so I guess the next question would be, what do you think makes a good pitch? Like what's a really, what makes it stand out? What What's a solid pitch? Um, so I think I've discussed this with the guys before, but for me, it's just, it has to start a research. Know the brand you're pitching on, the artist you're pitching on, you know, like, you should be able to delve straight into the research process as soon as you see something and be like, who are the creative directors on this? What is the brand's voice? What's the artist's voice? Um, you know, so you're not going in completely blind when you're writing something. Um, it's OK to ask questions as well about who is the creative director and then, you know, maybe have a quick look at what they've done before, their style. Um, you know, it's um, for me, that's really important. And then possibly personal touches so making sure that you come across like authentically um for example we were chatting the other day about doing a pitch for insurance and you know um no one loves insurance <laughs> no one and you know so you've got to remember like you can't you know no one wants to hear like I love this it's so exciting but maybe think about how it can relate to you as a person you know I'm in my 20s I'm starting to have a family or think about marriage or whatever and actually I feel like I'm starting to look into this so I understand the product and this is how I'm going to write about it you know client love that um, and so do artists maybe you listen to a band um you know a few years ago and you're like I really connected to this song and you're generally coming across like I want to work on this with you that's really important for me. Um, and to you, Josh, Ella? Dean, I think for me, and I completely agree with what you said, Holly, um, around like research, research, research. As a researcher and strategist, I absolutely would say underpinning your pitch with knowing who your brand is, but also knowing whether your idea sticks and um, has weight with the audience that it's going to reach that is absolutely fundamental because this is all communication everything we do in the creative industries is about communicating to another human being and um, whether it's communicating that in a pitch or communicating how your creative idea and how the film or content that it will go on to um, to share for the brand how that will then communicate an idea out to the audience that is fundamental so making it knowledgeable making it insightful making it um, actionable in the real world and really having those insights to push that through. I think that is super important. Um, but also it's um, in part about confidence, in part about how much you believe in your idea, in part about how that confidence shows by how you presented the idea, how the design is, how the sort of different elements of the pitch that come together to tell the whole story, how well that helps to support you through. Um, yeah, so many things go into making a good pitch, I guess. But yeah, research, I'm definitely going to put up there. Yeah, for me, I mean, <laughs> it's it's exactly the set, exactly what you guys do. I'm just going to echo what you guys have said again. But definitely research, definitely sort of personal touches. I think when you're pitching, let's say you're pitching a music video and you're pitching 
against a lot of people, I do think just humanizing your pitch is super important. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of directors that I work with, they'll, you'll, you'll write the pitch, don't use the artist's name, you know, like use, do your research, find out what they like. Like, it's so important to just have kind of show your personal connection, exactly what, you know, Josh, uh, Josh was, was saying just then, like, as human beings, we, we want to, we want to connect, we want to connect our ideas, we want them to resonate with, um, yeah, we just, we want to understand and, and I think that it's just, yeah, demonstrating that um, within your document and just, just setting the tone for the concepts that you're trying to communicate, um, keep it dynamic, engaging, but also keep it sort of concise um, and tailored and not too wordy, try and, try and, you know, get to the point you're trying to make first and then expand on it rather than kind of you know over over explaining um I think that's often for me what makes a good pitch one that's kind of efficient and can demonstrate what it's trying to say quickly mm -hmm. you know what that's so true Ella because we we've always told the directors like everyone always thinks like more is better always and then you get these pictures that come back and it's like 70 pages long and you're like that honestly no one is going to put the effort or energy into that no one has the time for it so exactly what Ella's saying like put together like you know even if it's six seven pages but they are the best pages ever and they look visually amazing and they sound great that's what it's all about not hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages it's a waste yeah. of everyone's time including your own you know what if you don't get it so yeah yeah you'll often find that actually when you're when you're pitching when you're writing it's like when you're writing an email you know the the most important thing that you're trying to say you've left right until the end um and it's like get that up there at the top and then all the rest probably like you know you can cut back you can trim it um, but yeah just reread and 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 condense I think and just try and really refine it yeah for sure um I guess the next I would ask what are some things you guys learned in your first pitches like you know obviously everyone has to start somewhere and we've got people kind of ranging in skill in this chat today some people starting out some people who've never done a pitch before and I think that it's like you know in anything that we do in the creative industry it's so important to be transparent about how things begin and the kinds of things that you learn and the kind of missteps you take so what was some some things that you learned in your first days of pitching um Ella can you kick off first mm, spell check <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no this you know when you're first starting out it's definitely really overwhelming like the process as a whole there's so many different elements to it you know the research side of it the writing the how do I get all of this these ideas into sort of kind of how do I categorize and compartmentalize everything and I think I definitely crumbled under the pressure at the you know at the start of the pitching process um presenting is really difficult um as someone that doesn't really like presenting so I think yeah don't be disheartened these skills take time and practice and the more you pitch the more you know the 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 better you'll become at it um I definitely think breaking things up in sort of manageable chunks really helps me I like to sort of have enough time in and out of the pitching process. So give yourself enough time. Don't, as much as we've all called like an all night at the, the day before trying to meet a deadline, but I think just try and give yourself enough time. Just take some time, spend some time writing, some time away, get some mood boards together. Then just again, have a bit of reflection. You'll probably get inspiration from the sources that, you know, that you're looking at. That will, that will further inform your writing and it will just, become it will start to flow really naturally but I think the hardest part is often starting it and the over the overwhelming nature of it as a whole but I think if you can kind of break it down and into smaller sections it does you know really help um and you Josh looking back to my first pitch that was that was an interesting time basically um how archetype started was that there were three of us friends out of school when we were um, a clothing company first and foremost. So what that meant off, uh, off the bat is that we were doing agency work behind the scenes and then doing um, sort of clothing stuff in front of the scenes. And the agency stuff, we would obviously have to pitch for to get the contracts and to get the work. And in the first couple of days, we thought that we had to embody something that we were, that we were not. 
um, which was sort of the corporate world, the business world, the sort of watch The Apprentice and see how to pitch world and that whole thing. And that's because we just didn't really have that much guidance and I guess coming up in, in terms of knowing like what people actually want to see. Um, and that meant that in going forward, we kind of did the weird thing where we were like, just not being ourselves. And that showed forth in our pitches. So people wouldn't give us stuff from early on because they knew that we weren't um, being as authentic as we could be. So as we then went forward and as we pushed on, we eventually got to own more of our source, own more of ourselves and embed that into our pitches and into our ideas and really try and push that forward. And then lo and behold, we get more people actually wanting to buy into us and buy into our ideas and the things that we um, sort of push forward. So really and truly, the thing that I learned the most from the first pitches to now is to actually let yourself show through and don't try and like cover it up with so many other things based on preconceptions that aren't necessarily true or accurate. Because when you're pitching for something, the person who's commissioned that pitch, the person who's commissioned that project definitely wants to see your original take on it, how yeah. your research is going to impact it how your creative idea is going to make an amazing piece mm. of produced content how your design ideas how your sort of visual references are going to push that through and make it hit the mark yeah so it's like your unique perspective is paramount in all of this and it's don't imitate anybody else and try to kind of like come into it differently than you would yeah no that makes sense and for you holly i'm about sorry learning about what are the first what, few pitches like some things that you learned that you could like you know share okay. sorry yeah. um yeah uh over promising which <laughs> is honestly it's it's really hard because you want your you always want your creative to be like the best thing ever and you want to add like rainbows and unicorns and make it look incredible but at the end of the day like it has to work to the schedule and the budget so and you know the client and the labels they're not stupid the chances are they you know have a lot of experience in this and they know what works so you know they don't want to you don't want to put a lot of effort in something and it comes back and you know they say is this achievable because and they just don't bother looking at it so it's really simple you just have to make sure that you are speaking to the right people through the pitch you know the creative is really important but chat to your producer chat to any of the um, heads of department maybe you've got a dp friend or you've got um, an art director friend so while you're writing this pitch you can back up everything you've said in it because mm -hmm. the pitch is something that's going to be made at the end of it so you, you have to make sure you can make it um yeah so that was probably what i learned when I was um, first pitching was putting in things that actually maybe weren't achievable and then not winning the job because of that. Yeah. You want to make what you say realistic because they can always kind of reference that treatment in the future and be like, well, we didn't get the flying monkeys. That's or what it's there for. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, we, you know, even on that note, it's like talking about what you put in there. It has to be representative of what you're going to make because you're going to be using that treatment um throughout the whole process you might give it to an editor you'll give it to your crew members yeah the client might sit in and edit with you so and they'll refer to stuff so just make sure that you want to make what you put in there as well because that's always the first thing yeah. <laughs> when you get to production and you don't actually like your idea or you don't think it's going to work because unfortunately it's sort of like a you know contract unless you change it massively the client has signed off on on that yeah no, that definitely makes sense. Do not overpromise. <laughs> um, okay, and then I guess moving on, mm -hmm. most pitches are unfortunately rejected. That's just kind of a universal thing that you all kind of need to get hip with is that most pitches are not going to see the light of day. However, I think that there's a lot to be learned from that. Um, can you guys just kind of speak on, you know, dealing with rejection and maybe an example of pitches you've lost, what you do differently, what you kind of learn from the experience? I think that rejection and loss and all of kind of that is just an opportunity to learn. And so I feel like it would be really important for everybody here to kind of learn how you guys have gone through that and how you've dealt with it. Um, start with you, Josh. Yeah, that one's always a difficult one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, dealing with lost pitches. In the early days, again, you always think it's about you, even though I just said that we weren't putting much of our originality into our pitch ideas, so isn't that hilarious? But a lot of the time, so I find that when 
like what's what's the saying like it's a no isn't always a flat out no sometimes it's a not now sometimes it's a not this sometimes it's a not yet um and all of those things always feel like no not ever especially when it's your first few pitches but a lot of the times like one thing to understand is people commissioning a lot of work like they're under different stresses that are coming from their funders and their teams and other sort of people that they've asked to pitch and other sort of regulations and things like that and also some things that are completely outside of your control that can all go on to determine the outcome of a pitch where it's not really something that you could have safeguarded against um but that's not to say that every single pitch loss is just because of stuff that happens like externally to you sometimes it is just down to someone not buying into your idea as much as you would have liked or um some other sort of um people who have also pitched being uh, or companies who have also pitched just be, being that much closer to the mark in terms of what the commissioner is looking for and i think one thing that's really important to remember is that once you've nailed down sort of your process of how you pitch and you understand that the ideas you're pitching are meeting the brief and are meeting the mark in terms of the creativity, in terms of the research, in terms of all of those little bits and pieces that go in there, the personal touches, the understanding of the brand. Even if you don't win, that A, is really good practice anyway, but also it's so good to show to a potential client because they will always remember how diligent you were in the pitch. They will always remember how diligent the document was that they received. They'll always remember how creative it was, even if they don't choose it. And one thing that we get a lot now, now that it's been, this will be our seventh year in business um, as Archetype, I think, um, we get a lot of people coming back from years ago to weeks ago who were like, mm, no, not sure. And then they come back and are like, oh, yeah, so we want to run with this, we want to run with that, we want to do this, and oh, could you rework up that idea that you had in 2019 and rework it for a post-pandemic, well, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens when not only you've shown that you're good in your pitch and like you're diligent and you know what you're doing, even if the idea isn't the one they selected, but it also, with the consistency of just continuing to put yourself out there, put your work out there, put your ideas out there, in the form of pitches, people will just come back. Um, it's the consistency, the building of confidence, I think that helps to deal with rejection, but also understanding that like, um, we put parts of ourselves into our work, but we're not holistically our work. So being able to, that's a little bit more, I guess, speak to your yeah. therapist about that one, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, we definitely aren't our work. That's actually something really important to remember. And I like what you said about kind of um, how rejection kind of leads to other opportunities. I was in BFI Film Academy, actually. So surprise, guys. It's good. It works. Here I am. Um, and the first script I, I did there, it was great. I was really proud of it. Um, and I pitched it to get some funding. But I didn't end up getting the funding. And I was so upset because I was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. But the person who was kind of in charge of that funding body is the person who gave me my first job on a production because they were like, oh, we really liked your energy. We kind of liked how fab you are and like kind of the vibe that you brought to everything. And they remembered that, like you always leave an impression. And I think what Josh said, that's really, really important that it's like, even if you don't think you're gonna get it, even if whatever, even if you fail, how much you put into stuff really, really shows. Um, and so people will always remember that. Um, I guess like Ella, um, what, what, yeah, what could you kind of bring to this and rejection and all that kind of thing? I, again, s s echoing what you and Josh have, have just said, but, I think, yeah, just don't let it run too deep. Um, don't let it trigger self-doubt. That is such a difficult, I know that that's, it's easy for me to say that, obviously, but I have to kind of check in with the, you know, the person that did let it trigger self-doubt like many, many years ago. But yeah, just losing a pitch doesn't doesn't mean that your idea wasn't good enough. Um, the, it, it, you will win one, um, you're, your pitches will get better your decks will get better just channel that rede that rejection into your creativity like your it's it's an evolution you know like it it won't be your last pitch and with every failed attempt there will be time for reflection try and get feedback where you can i think if 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 you are able to ask for feedback as well like more often than not as josh was saying it will be because 
oh, the, the budget was this, or we actually had a connection with this. It, it, it's very rarely your idea, like no idea is a bad idea. Maybe some are, but like really no idea is a, a bad idea. <laughs> Just get yourself out on the on the line, and yeah, it you'll just build resi resilience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you, Holly, do you have any kind of like pitches that you've lost that you've kind of learned something from, or like any kind of projection you've learned something from? I've lost so many. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually on a bit of a losing streak at the moment, so you've caught me at a really good time. Um, <laughs> no, but honestly, like it's it is. Um, I mean, you guys have covered it. I, there's there's not much more I can say to that although it's just you know I have lost pitches and then the agency or client have said but we've got another job for you actually and it's more money and then you're like yes um <laughs> so it is worth just putting in as much effort they, they get reused they get exactly shared around um it, it, it sucks the process and it's you know as the guys have said it can be so many different things budget schedule clients friends know someone that knows someone you know whatever it is um but just keep putting effort into it because you just don't want to pitch out there that isn't your best work that's basically it um I'm just thinking of any but I do you know what I'm not going to go into bad pitch stories because I think of them as a positive every pitch yeah. is a good sales <laughs> technique <laughs> that's all I can think about it so yeah that's, that's I'm not going to get neggy here <laughs> No, that's, that's great. Like, no, because it's right. Right. You know, you learn from every mistake that you make and you just get better every time. That's the thing. You should never even kind of see it as a loss. It's just kind of an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of had an overview about kind of like the process of pitching and all that kind of stuff, but I think it's kind of good to get into the kind of the specifics of pitching. Um, and one of those is visuals visuals play a major role in the pitch um and I guess this is more for Ella and Holly like how important are the kind of visual aspects of pitching well yeah Holly and I were well when we were all talking the other day um it's it's essentially like the visuals are so important because they are promising the vision of, of you know the the piece or the piece or the the music the music video the commercial the um tv series so yeah what you put in that document really does have to reflect how you want that vision to you know be conveyed so i think on a separate note from a timings point of view i do feel like more often than not like i'm guilty of it just like skimming a pdf and just like reading it after like i do think people want and this goes back to what i was saying about being concise and just really trying to nail what you're trying to say or how you know show what you're trying to show like as as efficiently as you can because I do think that yes you will connect with the written element of a pitch um, and it is super super important but I do think that often you know I'll skim through the pdf first and I'll be like wow oh that's an amazing visual god I'm interested now it's like there's something about a, a visual that will just connect with you and it will sit with you for for ages and I do think more often than not that that's what I'm kind of drawn back to, back to and then that kind of gets me all like I want to read about that you know so I do think like first impressions are super important and and it does conjure the mood like if you can nail the mood like it it, it really helps to get people engaged and get people on board with what you're trying to say yeah, yeah um just following on um you know because Ella and me work together a lot on the image side of stuff um obviously on a more just going back to what I said earlier on a completely practical level again it is your everything you put in that treatment it will be made is what you're you know what you're selling in so basically don't put an image of a beach in South Africa looking all lovely if you're <laughs> planning on shooting on the streets of London you know it's it's it sounds obvious but it happens all the time you're like well I've got all these exterior shots and <laughs> and you're not describing this you know maybe you're using an image of a couple and you're talking about casting that's fine to do that and say but reference that in the writing so I'm using this image um because I really like the way the girl is holding the hand of the guy um but it's not to do with the exterior location or the tone um we get it a lot where 
maybe you've covered your treatment in filmic images and you're not going to be shooting on film it's not going to look anything like that so mm -hmm. don't put filmic images all over your treatment um because you're trying to you're I guess you're trying to create a visual mood board and a tone anyway of what you're create of what you're going to be making so just make sure that those images match up to that and some of the best pictures I've done I look back at treatments or pictures and they look so similar and it's we've we've made what we have come up with you know and it just be mindful of that every time you're doing it. And that's why it's so important. If you can get an amazing image researcher, you know, use one, it's worth it. Or just spend some more time on imagery. Do not leave it last minute. I'd say it's like as, as important as the writing that goes into it. Um, yeah. And that you're so right, Holly. I think that as well, like you have to make sure that the visuals are appropriate for the type of pitch that you're doing as well. Like for example, I mean, I know that we'll, we're gonna talk about um, where to find visuals a bit later but you know you might you don't want to be looking up like really super highly stylized editorial images for like a campaign that's I don't know maybe for more serious kind of a charity um campaign that is you know not in, in of the same tone you know you like a music video might you might use more stylized imagery or you might find some more kind of like fashion images or it's it, it is you have to sort of set the tone with like the piece that you are pitching for rather than it being you have to gauge that um I think that is that is quite really important yeah no, that makes sense um so we've yeah we've kind of established kind of like visual res research is kind of like paramount to it and I guess the next question would be where do I find these images? Like, where where do I look? How do I search for them? What is the kind of best practices? And this is more for you, Ella, because you kind of spend a lot of time doing this. But um, where should you look for things? What what are what are some things you do kind of practically um, when image researching, when creating decks? Mm -hmm. Get into it. <laughs> yeah, I think more like where shouldn't you look is the question. I feel like just get <laughs> it just get inspiration from anywhere and everywhere. Really, I know that that's such a broad answer, but it's uh, f I, I mean I love like photography like I'm such a collector of like photography books and art books just magazines journals um there's if if you're looking for more filmic stuff like obviously you've got Vimeo um check out stuff pics director's library is great just for um more cinematic kind of shorts and stuff um I think more and more often like Instagram, um, production company websites, post houses. Um, yeah, it, it very much, it depends on what you're trying to, what mood you're trying to set really. I think if you're looking for casting references, maybe check out some talent websites. Like there are plenty of sort of um, casting agencies that specialize in more sort of authentic casting, like real people, like, there, there there are many many different places where you can find imagery um it's just about sort of starting to compile compile a list of of, of resources <laughs> set some bookmarks and maybe if you use like arena or pinterest or there's places like um sorry i feel like i'm just literally next just name name dropping all i think they're really useful but i, I feel like when i first yeah. started out i was just like oh my god where do people get get this kind of stuff from so i do think the more you hunt for stuff the more you will start to realize that oh like this production company sort of has a certain vibe like a certain tone like the directors might all kind of have some sort of style that's in, you know in common or um like a <laughs> you will start to sort of find the similarities and and you'll gradually build up a bit of an algorithm as to where to go for um for that kind of stuff and yeah photography journals like British Journal of Photography um it's nice that uh, just any anywhere really <laughs> sorry long-winded answer 
No, 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 that's great. Because I think it's like one of those things where people kind of really need specific sites. Because I think sometimes yeah. in searching, it's like, you know, when people ask, where do I find, like, what do I do if I want to make treatments? People like do image researching, but it's yeah. like, it's not a dumb question to be like, well, where? What are yeah. the specific places that people use? Because I think it's like, you know, like the answer you just gave is good because yeah. it's like your personal experience and you're someone who actually does this in your job. So it's yeah. like actually valuable and like it's a tangible place people can look. Yeah, and I think like Shot Deck and Film Grabber and, and, and places like that are great if you're kind of doing something more for like a longer, uh, maybe like more of a TV film, like series Bible, that kind of stuff. Um, I do think as well, if you haven't if you haven't heard of it, then reverse image search is like the one thing I wish I knew when I first started out, <laughs> just because so many of the images on the internet are like teeny tiny pixel sizes and you're just you don't want to be including that in a, in a document that you're trying to sell in as like a really beautiful kind of uh visual essay so I think um yeah just drop that drop that small image into google and reverse image search and you'll find a bigger version and it will make your document look better <laughs> yeah great thank you Ella um Okay, I guess we've spoken a bit about the visuals and like where to get them. Um, yeah, and we spoke before, we'll try and get as many of these links for you guys. Once we put this all on YouTube, there'll be links in the description for the things we mentioned. Um, so that will be really helpful for everybody who wants to kind of go check them out. Um, but yeah, we've said visuals are great, but then another key pillar of this is research. We've, we've spoken about it quite consistently, generally at the beginning, but Josh, could you kind of just speak to us a bit about um, what role research plays in a pitch and kind of how they support different pitches you've done and, you know, what's important, where you find your research, just like enough for people to know what, yeah, what that kind of research aspect is. Absolutely. And <laughs> I think for me, research is the way you substantiate the story you're telling in your pitch. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say you have slides upon slides, because this is what a lot of people do, which really kind of tires me out, especially when I'm a researcher freelancing around. <laughs> is, oh, now let's have this slide on the stats of insert demographic here. Let's not do that. Let's instead embed sort of whether it's stats or whether it's qualitative data, mm -hmm. i.e. what the opinions people say, um, or whether it's quantitative, i.e. data points. Um, let's embed that throughout sort of the storytelling of a pitch and using it not just dropping a data point here dropping a qual insight there dropping all that kind of stuff in and around but also before you get to the stage of even writing up your pitch ensuring that your idea has legs i think that's where re research helps the most um and in terms of like how to even get to that stage where you've got the research to substantiate your idea me personally i love starting from that space and before having this like cool creative idea sometimes time doesn't allow for it and sometimes you have to work backwards to validate your idea after you've already in um, thoughts on it um, created it also some ideas just don't need that much substantiation because they're really cool but also I do like starting at the beginning from the research point I do like starting by just doing a quick suite of desk research a lot of the time a lot of like sort of cultural institutions or research agencies that like operate in culture so my um, mm -hmm. special specialisms are Gen Z, whatever that means, and mm -hmm. which I guess most of you in the audience are, and um, marginalized communities. So I'm constantly looking um, not only in traditional media, but also in sort of more new age media. So you've got your politics, Joe, your politics for all, UK fact check, all that sort of stuff to just look at what the cultural zeitgeist is saying. Then also looking deeper into like your more niche publications like a Guap magazine, a No Signal Radio, a Represent Radio, a Galdem, a Black Ballad, a Refinery29 really yeah. looking deep into those like articles and those points around whatever the creative idea is that we're pitching then sort of getting stuck into research studies whether it's a GWI um, if that's available to you or maybe a business of fashion if it's sort of on the that consumer side or even just um, little trend reports that come out of a lot of youth marketing agencies, student marketing agencies, um, On Road's a good resource, um, their Instagram, Liberty's a good resource. Um, they um, provide quite a bit of research out there. Hype Collective, I used to do the research over there at the student marketing agency. Um, sort of all of these different places to just get that desk sweep sort of data download in your mind and be really familiar with what you're talking about then going through um, and seeing which parts are relevant, which parts aren't, and which parts go and help to substantiate your idea or to maybe even detract from your idea. 
And that's really when you go through that refinery brainstorm stage with you and your team, or just you, if it's just you, um, or a friend, use your friends, family members as sounding board. If it's like your first couple of pitches, that, that definitely helps getting real world opinions in. Um, and then refining that idea to shape the insights that you found. And it's not just a thing of like, oh, 60% of, this isn't a real stat, 60% of young people enjoy going out and watching insert thing here. Um, and then adding that in and saying, oh, well, this doesn't validate this other stat that I, that I saw. So therefore my idea is invalid. It's more thinking about how you can solutionize based off the information that you are presented and yeah. how that might affect location bit. Say if your idea was initially gonna be set in I don't know, an estate somewhere in Southeast London, but you realize your demographic actually don't resonate as much with that anymore. Maybe you can keep your central idea, but change the location um, based on the research that you find and things like that as that sort of goes on. And then um, in my decks, I like to have one slide, one slide of research. That's the maximum yeah. and then mm. sort of story tell throughout that and that those are short decks by the way if i'm if i'm writing like a 40 50 page treatment then oof, maybe we're gonna have to add more but in sort of 10 20 slides a couple slides of research is fine and then sort of just dropping in little bits and pieces that tell that through line story um that your creative idea um is pushing forward um that's my methodology yeah no thank you for that josh um, I guess, yeah, okay, so we've kind of touched on different ways you can pitch, different pitches there are, what you need in a pitch. Um, we've talked about the negatives of pitching, what you learn from it. But I also think it would be quite great to hear from a pitch you guys have won and that you really enjoyed and what you think made it a strong pitch and like what, what you did in that pitch that kind of made it positive. And I know you said you've been on a losing streak, Holly, but I'm going to start with you. Um, and maybe you can just tell us a bit about like a pitch you've won that you were really, really proud of and why you think that worked. Um. Sure. I mean, I can talk about uh, one I did with Ella, which was an H&M uh, pitch that we worked on together and we um, for direct to Leon Award. Um, I think that look as a pitch process, it was super smooth. The imagery was spot on. Um, and that's like one of the um, examples I was talking about earlier, that when you look back on uh, a final film and when it's been delivered, the, the treatment is the same thing. Um, the references were on point. Everything was just, you know, look great. And I think we all work very closely as a team now. We're lucky we have worked a lot together. So we sort of have, you know, that shorthand and how we how we operate with a pitch. But with Leon, I we <clears throat> chat in the beginning about the process. So everything is that she puts it past the producer. So there's no nasty surprises. And so it just makes sure that the pro the whole process is super simple. And that when we get it, we know that you know it's going to be smooth going through. Um, that one worked really well. I've recently, I think, I guess also with pitches, the more time you can spend on something, the better it is. Yeah. Anything that's <laughs> just with it, like anything is more complicated. I've recently um, just delivered a Hennessy commercial with Alicia Keys, which means because it was such big talent, we have to keep constantly changing it and putting it past. But what it did mean is we had a lot of time to keep going back and finessing the pitch. Um, mm. And that would be numbers and, you know, everything to do with the budget. And it meant that I was, very aware of what was happening at the process the whole time and I had a lot of contact with the director and a lot of contact with the talent and everything like that so I mean I guess they're really they're successful pitches and things have gone gone really well um yeah I think I think they're good examples I don't know if Ella wants to follow on about the H&M thing because I know we quite like that and everyone keeps wanting to use the treatment that she designed as yeah. like the template I know now. it makes it, yeah it makes my life so much easier but also I'm like oh it'd be nice to use a different everyone's just seems to connect with that that layout so uh, but yeah no it was so nice that as Holly was saying that that process was just I think we've developed like because we've been doing this for quite a while and we've obviously developed a bit of a rhythm with working with working with one another and it's just become quite an organic um process similarly for for Leon you know like we'll have a we'll have if I was breaking it down like the brief would come in we would all jump on a call chat I'd chat to Leon and we'd start sort of breaking down like in the days into 
luckily with the H&M one, I think we had quite, quite a few days on it. So we were able to really delve into the research and sort of refine and um, Leon was able to sort of shape her, her writing and then that informed more of the visuals and then it just got better and better and better. And um, yeah, I think the reason that one succeeded was because we, we, we really elevated it. We looked at the H&M sort of tone of voice, the branding, we stripped it back and put it in like this really elegant, like um, clean sort of layout that really meant that the visuals could just like pop and be really impactful. And also we, you know, we embedded quite a lot of clips and set the tone, which I do think really helps for, um, for treatments. If you can get some, um, some video in there, some sound embedded, um, it, it really does help to elevate it. Sorry, Ella, I just was thinking you do with it. Um... Sorry, guys. I think we're going to be running low on time now. Oh, um, sorry. You guys are I'm just going to talk about the music. <laughs> Yeah, but music, that, that was that was actually, I'll let you finish that, Holly, actually. Just no, to, no, to, I was just going to say, Ella started putting music into um, the the treatments and we hadn't do, done that before and it, it's so cool. It works so well. And that's yeah. all I was jumping in on. Yeah. If you can do it. Like, <laughs> no, that's okay. Because it sets a tone as you're reading Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like, yeah. It, it, Even sets a pace. Edit yeah. and music, I think clips and audio really do help to elevate your pictures. So get those in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Um, so we're going to be moving on to questions in a second. I just want to say thank you, Holly. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ella, for kind of like giving us all of that detail. And just to round off, you guys have kind of three key takeaways is that make sure you do your research, give yourself enough time, um, you know, put yourself out there, be authentic to yourself. And as cheesy as it sounds, authenticity is kind of the main source here is what I've gotten from each of you, that the authentic point of view that you're coming at this from is paramount. Um, so we want to make sure that we do that. Um, but yeah, we're going to be like taking, we're going to just have some time to do a few of the questions you guys have sent. Um, I'm going to get them open now. One second. Yeah. Um, so I think the first one is, I guess, for Ella, more likely. What software would you recommend um, for designing or making your pitch on? Um, I I always tend to use InDesign just because I use it. Um, I'm so it's like my second nature now. Um, it's good. It has good interactive capabilities. So obviously including GIFs and embedding sound and um, publishing online links. So for that reason, I think it's pretty good. I mean, if you're looking for something like a lot of agencies will use kind of Google Slides or Miro and stuff. But I do find that for me and designs like the um, the one that I can work the quickest in. Um, what about you, Josh? InDesign, I think, is what our designers use. They love it. Um, but then our clients are like, mm, mm, we want to use Google Slides. So we also use Google Slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly that, right? Um, yeah. And um, Keynote as well. Keynote is a very big underdog. For those of you who have MacBooks or Mac um, products, Keynote is ridiculously simple and intuitive. It's like a what you see is what you get kind of PowerPoint, but not as clunky as PowerPoint. And you can do a lot of that sort of the, the moving image stuff, the music embedding stuff, the video embedding stuff a lot easier in Keynote than I think a lot of other platforms. Yeah, I think I would attest to that. I would say that Keynote is much easier for entry level of like yeah, exactly. treatment. And especially also if you're kind of like coming out as a writer, there's definitely like pitches that I've done for writing or a thing that I've done on Keynote because I just find Keynote easier to use as someone who's not a designer. So I would yeah. say that depends what you're using it for. If you're using it for visual things and you are a designer and you like that visual aspect, I would say what Ellis said um, and using mm -hmm. InDesign. But if you're a writer, like you don't have to really know how to use InDesign, you can use Keynote. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, and then someone said, would you guys recommend non-traditional slides? I feel like we kind of um, answered this um, about not like using traditional slides in your deck, like adding music and things like that, using clips. That's always helpful. Holly, you look mm -hmm. at treatments and pictures and things as well. Um, what do you think? Is it important to kind of introduce non-traditional kind of media in your slides? Yeah, I think um, absolutely. Like we've got younger 
fresher, cooler directors now writing on everything. And so, you know, you want the treatment to represent who you are and your style. So, you know, the more unusual and interesting it looks, I think the better. Obviously, again, know your client. It's exactly if you're going to be writing to some kind of like, I don't know, stuffy old school type of client and you just, is maybe like a money job, maybe just keep it a little bit more um, calm. Um, and just because you've got to remember as well that people have to be able to read it. And as, as a really boring practical note, um, a lot of people that have trouble with their eyesight can't actually read the words and we get things sent back quite a lot going this looks amazing but we can't read anything so (laughs) that's something to think about when you're looking at the kind of non-traditional ways of doing it but like we mentioned earlier I think anything that creates like interest and buzz um remember an agency is or a label they want to sell in your idea um to the artist or the client you know it looks good for them so the cooler it is and the more that people will talk about it is always you know better I think anyway yeah yeah that's that's something I was actually going to touch on forgot to talk about earlier but exactly what Holly was saying about you can make your layouts and Um, document really dynamic and engaging but the legibility and flow is super important and I think that if you're trying to design and this is something that I've learned from many years of of doing this but don't go too crazy with all the different layout styles try and set a couple of uh, sort of sort of rules to follow maybe set yourself like a clean slide that allows you to tell the story maybe there's something that's a bit more okay this is going to be my mood setter just try and not overwhelm it with so many different types of designs and pages and, and and variations, because I think that sort of adds to that element of getting a bit lost and not really knowing where you are in the pitch. And I do think that people want to be able to read it easily. Um, so, so there is a bit of a balance with that. Um, so yeah, I tend to sort of set a few rules within the document for that reason. Well, I guess following on from that, what are like some essential categories and sections that you think should be involved in the deck? Like what are the main, main things that should be in your deck? And I'll go to you, Josh. Well, depends on what you're pitching for, but mm-hmm. you, you've really got to have your like less than 10 words, what your idea is about slide. You've got to have your um, sort of about you slide, mm-hmm. short bio um can keep it quite visual you've got to have your I'm also doing it not in the right order by the way sorry Um, (laughs) (laughs) but you've got to have like um well if if this is now we're talking about music video commercial pitches you've got to have your thoughts on well design of the entire thing so I'm talking about location shots I'm talking about sort of casting notes I'm talking about um like team personnel notes so sort of designing of your entire project is what I'm referring to again those research slides if it if it allows it or you can sort of bake your research into when you go on to further explain the idea and storyboard it Obviously, you gotta storyboard it um what else do we like to add in um I don't know agency pitches are slightly different because then you've got a um sort of talk about like more built out team slides and like methodology and all that kind of stuff. Um, But if it doesn't warrant it, then yeah, I think that's mostly, although I know I'm forgetting something. Amazing. Um, And Holly, you you get a lot of scripts and stuff and um, different kinds of pitches in that way. Um, There's a question here about like, if you're a screenwriter, how long should that be? Should you ever share a full script for something? How much information should you include Um, when you're pitching? Do you only send it like after they've said, yes, we're interested? Do you send the full thing? Um, What's your advice on that? Um, Screenwriter. Is yeah, that like someone sending like a script, like a script, let's say maybe for a music video or something, I don't know. Or okay, so for a script that would come in, um, that would, from say an agency, that would tend to be an idea from um, a creative that would oh, come in, not an actual um, script. So a script for screenwriting, I'm, unfortunately, I don't work in that world, so I can't give you much advice. Um, I work in the commercial music video side not the feature or script side. Um, But what I would say about that is we get a lot of scripts sent to the office um, and that people don't tend to look at it. So do make sure you go through script writing agencies or anything like that if you're trying to do that. BFI as well. I have um, applied and I did a BFI short 
about two years ago um, and we had to send over um, it was for a documentary but they are incredible with giving you funding and advice and linking you and pairing you with other up and coming producers and people like that so um, that's the advice I'd probably give for anyone that's going into script writing yeah that makes sense um, and then we have a question here about like is pitching like mostly online now post COVID is everything you do kind of sending via email or on zoom or do you still pitch in person is that something that happens Josh does. Josh, yeah. Um, it still is a bit of both. I think initially pre-pandemic, it was all in person and a lot of it was about sort of the atmosphere that you pitched in and sort of the environment. So we tried to take people to sort of like the nice places in, in London or whichever city we were in. Um, mm -hmm. Then pandemic came and it was amazing. I could pitch from my house. I could sort of have made my breakfast five minutes earlier and then just log on and then it's wonderful. And then I'm pitching and then I'm, I'm off now to do something else. Great stuff. Um, I think it depends on your client. Clients who like the sort of glitz and glam stuff. So I'm thinking you're more like commercial brands, the big cultural players, they will still want in-person pitches if they're not too stressed and sort of busy with their internal teams. Um, mm. And similar thing with the agencies who do that kind of work. Um, for a lot of the public sector work we do, they are still more than happy with online. Um, a lot of the times it's because they have like more of a sort of diligent process because they're so highly regulated by government and um, so they have so many to get through and they would much rather sort of do it online in that in that sort of system but I think the how you pitch remains the same like all of that other external stuff about like the environment and like whether you're in a shortage house or whether you're in a coffee shop that doesn't matter um, it's just about how you're conveying it and about what you're actually pitching great i think we only have time for like one question really really quickly um i know you just touched on this holly i just wanted to make sure that people get um a couple more ideas of what to pitch you mentioned bfi is there any other things that come to mind that people can pitch like documentary music video or any of that kind of thing before or like yeah um i mean bfi is obviously the best for all of that sort of stuff it's always worth as well like um contacting if you're not a signed director maybe contacting labels um just to see if there's anything music videos that they might be looking for pictures on um there is also loads and loads of festivals that will take in pictures um mm -hmm. But what I can do is, um, I think we've got a bit more of a resource back in the office for this, so yeah, I can get some, yeah. get some like um, names together and then send it all over because it would it would take me it would bore you yeah. all if I signed up. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I think it would be really helpful yeah. actually because <laughs> sure, it can no be quite way. scary, right? When you're young and like, where do I pitch? Because it's like this is a lot of information, but you can learn something. But where does it go ultimately? Yeah. So actually, I just want to say thank you again to all our panelists. Thank you guys for your questions. Um, what I might do as well is kind of round, round out some of the other questions we didn't get a chance to ask and prepare some resources for that, that maybe can be linked into this video so that you guys can get the information. Um, but thank you for joining us today. I hope this has been useful.